Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I'm very, very happy to um, welcome you to a very special speaker at a very special event. Um, this evening, uh, we mark the beginning of the 30th anniversary celebration of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. But before I talk about uh, President Dickey and the center that bears his name, I do want to pay tribute to the Dickey Center Board of Visitors and their illustrious chairman, Sandy McCulloch, who have been so generous in their wise counsel, unflagging support, and commitment of time and resources to the Dickey Center. And I would just ask them if they could please stand. And I also want uh, to recognize in particular uh, Bill Obenshane, class of 1962, and his wonderful wife, Penny, uh, for helping make this uh, evening possible. And Bill, would you please stand? <laughs> the Dickey Center came into being in 1982 to fulfill President Dickey's belief that any well-educated American must have an awareness of the world beyond this country's borders, and equally important, a commitment to do something about the world's problems. He came to Dartmouth in 1945 after a distinguished career in the US Department of State, and as a member of the United States delegation to the United Nations Conference in San Francisco. While president of Dartmouth, he, con he continued to take on a number of tasks related to public policy and government. There was, of course, the very famous Great Issues course over the first two decades of his presidency. But there were also many other, mostly less familiar ways in which he made Dartmouth a school where global considerations were at the forefront decades before the term globalism became fashionable. To take just one example, during the very depths of the Cold War in, the in 1960, he helped plan an informal gathering of American and Soviet citizens in Hanover as a way for leading figures in the two countries to begin frank discussions that would hopefully lead to better understanding between the peoples of these antagonistic nations. He was concerned with war, the search for peace, making sure that all Dartmouth students realized the extent to which events in the international arena affected them and stimulating them to work to better the planet. His fall 1946 convocation talk where he famously told students that the world's troubles are your troubles set the tone for the remainder of his years as president. The next year's convocation speech focused on humility and the need for us to practice modesty in our aspirations for dealing with the world's problems and peoples. Over a decade later, speaking about community, he placed that concept in its broadest terms and made comments that have yet to lose their relevance. And I quote, today's world, he said, is one in many things, but it is assuredly still short of a community with enough sense of common cause in law to keep the peace. On a world basis, we have barely begun the work of creating the understanding and building thereon the political institutions within which the enduring tension between independence and union can be creatively reconciled for nations, as the nations at their best have done for individuals. The Dickey Center, as I mentioned, was established by the Board of Trustees in 1982, and I quote our mission, to coordinate, sustain, and enrich the international dimension of liberal arts education at Dartmouth, unquote. The John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding has helped ensure that Dartmouth maintains its sense of forward mission and commitment with humility to the world community. 
To refer to one of Dickey's greatest interests, it has established the interdisciplinary minor in international studies for all majors and a vigorous war and peace program which, bring to, which brings together students from, from a variety of disciplines to address the political, social, cultural, and ethical issues that arise in dealing with global conflicts and understand what needs to be done to overcome their effects. To emulate the Great Issues course, the Dickey Center established the Great Issues series of public lectures, which has brought many distinguished speakers to Dartmouth, including our distinguished speaker this evening, Professor Anne-Marie Slaughter. The center also supports students in a variety of other ways, sponsoring student groups and encouraging student initiative and research through the Dickey International Internships and the Richard D. Lombard Public Service Fellowships, which are administered in co-sponsorship with the Tucker Foundation. I particularly want to note that the Dickey Center has programs that reach out all across this institution to each of the three professional schools, as well as to the arts and sciences. This has been the hallmark of the Dart Dartmouth Global Health Initiative, in which the Dickey Center worked closely with the Dartmouth Medical School to create a series of programs that also involve the Tuck Business School and Thayer Schools, and the Thayer Engineering School, as well as arts and sciences. The Dickey Center's Institute of Arctic Studies, under the leadership of Professor Ross Virginia, facilitates both student and faculty research in climate change and its policy implications through major international conferences and a new PhD program funded by the National Science Foundation. Today, the Dickey Center stands poised to augment its role even further. Working with the Dean of Faculty, Mike Mastanduno, who's here, and the Government Department, the Center is introducing a new postdoctoral program which will bring scholars and practitioners from several disciplines to Dartmouth for one year to work on issues in international relations and U.S. foreign policy. The Dickey Center is indeed a worthy inheritor of John Sloan Dickey's vision and concerns. The Dickey Center, with its contributions to the curricular goals of the school, its efforts to bring together both faculty and students from every corner of the institution to engage in the great issues of the day, its manifold programs that bring Dartmouth to the world and the world to Dartmouth, and its paramount concern for creating a deeper understanding of as well as involvement with the problems of the world, celebrates learning in all its manifestations. It plays a vital role in what John Sloan Dickey would have called a good education. Now, in choosing uh, the speaker tonight uh, to begin this very important occasion in the life of the Dickey Center, um, it was really self-evident uh, to those of us uh, who follow uh, foreign affairs, who follow, uh, who's really amongst the leaders um, in, 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 in thinking and, and, and in analyzing international relations. And we're absolutely delighted to have uh, Professor Anne-Marie Anne Slaughter with us tonight. She is the Bert G. Kerstetter University Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. And I'm very proud to say that from 2009 to 2011, she served as Director of Policy Planning for the United States Department of State, the first woman to hold that position. And upon leaving the State Department, she received the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, the highest honor conferred by the State Department for her work leading the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Dipl Development Review. And for those of you not familiar, this was a very, very important uh, study uh, that really has brought to life uh, the smart power strategy that Secretary Clinton and Professor Slaughter have been so strong uh, advocates of. And it's based on three key elements, defense, diplomacy, and development. Uh, 
And as a former U.S. ambassador, um, one of the things that I really paid close attention to was the recommendation uh, to give uh, chief submission, chief submission uh, ambassadors all the tools and authority to serve as real CEOs uh, of multi-agency missions. Um, you'll also notice certain parallels between uh, Professor Slaughter's career and John Sloan Dickey. That was another reason that uh, we wanted to get her here. Um, she is a frequent contributor to both mainstream and new media, publishing op-eds in major newspapers, magazines, and blogs around the world, and curating foreign policy news for over 8,000 followers on Twitter. She regularly appears on CNN, the BBC, NPR, and PBS, lectures widely, and has served on boards of organizations ranging from the Council of Foreign Relations and the New America Foundation to the McDonald's Corporation and the Citigroup Economic and Political Strategies Advisory Group. Foreign Policy Magazine named her to their annual list of the top 100 global thinkers in 2009 and 2010. Prior to her government service, Professor Slaughter was the dean of Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs from 2002 to 2009, where she rebuilt the school's international relations faculty and created a number of new centers and programs. And she shared uh, much of her experience and expertise uh, in that um, uh, work uh, with a group of faculty just before coming here this evening. She has edited or written six books and over 100 articles. She was also the convener and academic co-chair with Professor John Eikenberry of the Princeton Project on National Security a multi-year research project aimed at developing a new bipartisan national security strategy for the United States. In 2005, she co-chaired Princeton's self-study on internationalism, and from 1994 to 2002, uh, she was the J. Sinclair Armstrong Professor of International, Foreign and Comparative Law, and, and director of the International Legal Studies Program at Harvard Law School. She received her BA from Princeton, Master of Philosophy and Doctor of Philosophy in International Relations from Oxford, and she also has a JD from Harvard. Again, very similar to John Sloan Dickey. Please welcome um, uh, Professor Anne Marie Slaughter. Thank you. <laughs> Want to start there. Thank you. That was a, a wonderful introduction. It's it's great to be here. Uh, you will note, uh, con contrary to that wonderful long introduction, uh, this has a rather shorter one. Uh, you'll see uh, why I think by the end of this talk uh, why I prefer to introduce myself as a foreign policy curator on Twitter. So I'm promising you uh, a view behind the headlines. These are actually the headlines from today's New York Times. Uh, and I want to focus on them for a minute just because I think they uh, capture the tremendous diversity of foreign policy issues today. So the first, you see uh, people in Beijing very angry uh, over dirty air. That in itself may not be new, but actually what is interesting uh, is that the Beijing populace is getting its information on the real quality of Beijing air from U.S. Embassy tweets, uh, which are rather indicate a higher level of pollution uh, than the Beijing city authorities do. Uh, and the, that has actually been the subject of some diplomatic controversy uh, with the United States. Uh, Russia dismissing calls for new sanctions on Iran. Well, now that's one of the oldest issues in foreign policy in the sense of potential conflict between great powers, uh, and uh, particularly with nuclear uh, issues, certainly since 1945. Uh, this, of course, uh, relates to the report that just came out uh, on Iran's efforts uh, to obtain nuclear weapons. An earthquake kills at least seven in Turkey. Natural disasters are now global issues. Uh, of course, this is not as uh, this is an aftershock of the previous uh, earthquake, but these are, th are things that now mobilize countries. Uh, then we have two, of course, from Europe, <laughs> which has been dominating our headlines. 
Italy poised to name a new government, uh, and Greece actually uh, then putting together uh, a, a, a new government. Here again, it's interesting to note the economic dimension to foreign policy. The state of central banking in Europe, the state, of course, of currency in Europe, the state of deficits of individual countries, a huge matter for all of us because of the interconnected uh, global economic system. Uh, and then uh, Rio Police Capture Drug Lord. That one should be read together with the bottom one, uh, which is the journal from Ciudad Juarez about uh, angels rushing in where others fear to tread. Both of those are about drug violence. Uh, horrific violence, violence comparable to that in, uh, of many civil wars created by global narcotics networks focused in Central America and Mexico, but also, of course, in Brazil and across to West Africa. Uh, and then Russia's seamy underside, again, global networks not just with drugs, but global networks of arms traffickers. Victor Boot, Boot a Russian, was just convicted. Uh, and as we will see, traffickers in women and children, money launderers. So we're going everything from traditional great power nuclear issues to economic issues to natural disasters to global criminal networks. All right, so if we think about what's behind these headlines uh, and go back beyond what is an ever more complex uh, daily set of issues. Indeed, Secretary Clinton used to say she was told uh, to not do everything and to focus on a few issues, but she would often say, so what exactly am I supposed to leave out? Afghanistan, a global pandemic, nuclear proliferation. If you look behind all this, you get this thing that we call the international system. Now, the international system cannot be seen any more than a state can be seen. It is something we project, something we imagine is out there. And how we imagine it is very important for what we actually do as a nation, and I hope to show you uh, as individuals. So let's go back uh, 50 years. Uh, 50, it'll be 50 years next year, 1962. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking, this is, of course, not when you were young. This is when I hope many of your parents were young. I hope it's not uh, your grandparents. Or, uh, but this is the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is October of 1982. When I came back from the State Department to Princeton, I, I left the State Department on January 28th, and uh, I was teaching four, five days later in early February. The Egyptian government was also falling, but I was focused on having to teach a new class. And I taught a class of Princeton seniors, and in April, they handed in their theses. Every Princeton senior has to write a thesis. And I remember that that's not a great night to give homework. Uh, you're really not going to get a lot of attention the next day. They're celebrating. They're exhausted. So the next day in my seminar, I assigned 13 days. I mean, I showed 13 days. It's a very good movie. Uh, Kevin Costner, it's the movie uh, that really is a pretty accurate account of what the executive committee, some of the people sitting around this table, were doing over the 13 days that the world was on the brink of nuclear destruction. At least nobody fell asleep. They were all awake. Uh, and afterwards, when the lights came up, I said to them, what is the biggest difference between the world of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the world of today. A biggest difference other than the fact that everybody smoked, because that's <laughs> So uh, they said there were only two states in the world, the United States and the Soviet Union. There is a scene in the movie where the national security advisor says to the president, China invaded India today, but you don't want to hear about that. That was true. China did invade India in October of 1962. It was a footnote. Can you imagine today what it, China invading India? So I want to start with the Cuban Missile Crisis world, this world uh, that looks very different uh, from the world we're in today. And I want to talk about some of its key features. So the first is a limited number of states. 
as I said, two countries in the world. Of course, there were more than two countries in the world, but essentially it was a bipolar system, the United States, the Soviet Union, other countries uh, intersecting. Obviously, there was NATO and the Warsaw Pact, but a limited number of actors. And there were actually many fewer states in the world. Uh, there were only 51 states when the UN uh, was actually created. Now, of course, there are 194. So a limited number of actors, and they are states. And we think about them classically as billiard balls. This is a, a term coined by the great international relations scholar Arnold Wolfers, but it sticks with most people because you sort of imagine states colliding into each other in this space that we call the international system. One way to think about that uh, is what were the issues then? Well, this is the quote from the Cuban Missile Crisis. Dean Russ, the Secretary of State, said, we were eyeball to eyeball and the other guy just blinked. Foreign policy at that point was a matter of diplomacy and defense. Fortunately, in this case, diplomacy worked, so we didn't have to move to defense. But the key issues of the day were great power conflict and avoiding great power conflict uh, and all the permutations, diplomatic uh, and military, around the world. So a few states. Uh, they were states as the primary actors, uh, and really diplomacy and defense was the core of foreign policy. Third dimension, separation. Now, when we took my children, and my sons are, are 13 and 15, and two years ago, uh, we took them to Berlin and we showed them a fragment of the Berlin Wall. And they essentially looked at it, and they looked at the city, and they said, really, Mom? Are you kidding? A wall divided a city? A wall divided a city, a wall divided a country, a wall divided a continent and the world. We, separation, the idea that states were very, very separate. Indeed, you could actually divide uh, the world, obviously, into the communist world uh, and the free world. But you could, the, this is the icon of the Cold War, separation. All right. Then I want to, if we're thinking about, uh, well, let me just say, obviously to, the reason my kids responded that way is we're so interconnected. The idea that you could have people in East Berlin and West Berlin who wouldn't be connected because of a physical barrier is really unimaginable. I want to talk about today's world. That was the Cuban Missile Crisis world, and we just blipped through it. Uh, many of us lived through it, but uh, for today's purposes, we just went through 50 years. We're now in a world I call Lego world. You might think I'm spending a little too much time with my kids. Or, um, so let me give you the features of Lego world. First place, everything is connected and can be disassembled and reconnected in any way you like. Countless, countless, countless permutations. All right, so now let's look at the actors. Uh, let's look at the issues. Uh, and let's look at the, the sort of dominant mode of that world. First of all, our billiard balls, Lego states. Gotta love the internet. You type in Lego billiard ball to Google Images and hundreds of images came up. People make everything out of Lego. Now, this is very important. The whole reason that billiard balls have stuck for my generation in international relations is the, the opaque nature captured the idea that the state is the primary unit in international relations. You don't look inside the state. It's the state and it collides with other states. Well, these states can be taken apart in all sorts of different ways uh, and combined, as we will see, with all sorts of other actors. So let's imagine Lego billiard balls. Give you a concrete example of what I mean by combining and recombining. So, cook stoves. We in the State Department spent quite a bit of time on global cook stoves. Now, I am willing to bet that in the entire time that Ambassador Yalowitz was in the State Department, he did not work on cook, cook stoves. I think not a hard bet. Cook stoves, inefficient wood burning uh, cook stoves are a major source of carbon emissions in the world. 
They are a huge health hazard because you've got women and families breathing in carcinogens in very close environments, and not just carcinogens, but just basically smoke in very close environments. And for women who have to get the wood that fuels them or other fuel, sometimes it's animal dung, it's very unsafe in many countries. When women get killed or raped, it is often when they are gathering wood. So actually, if you can adopt clean, if you can get the adoption of clean cookstoves, you are addressing climate change, you're addressing global, global health and hence development in many of these countries, and you're empowering women, which is one of the key things we try to do uh, in development. So we help put together the Alliance for, the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves. Now, this is where the state is a Lego state. This came about because the State Department and the Environmental Protection Agency got together. That doesn't seem so difficult. It's actually harder than getting many countries together. Uh, not only that, Health and Human Services was part of this, and USAID, and the Centers for Disease Control and Pre uh, Prevention. That's five US agencies. So think about taking apart the state into those different agencies. And they partnered with the German Development Agency and the Dutch Development Agency, who in turn partnered uh, with the Economic Ministry from Peru, uh, various different uh, countries, and Norway. They then partnered with a number of major uh, corporations, with Dow Corning, uh, with Shell, and with a number of foundations, the UN Foundation uh, and some large NGOs. Lego State. You're putting together parts of the government with large corporations, foundations, universities, non-governmental organizations, and you're creating a global alliance that will tackle a major problem, an environmental problem, a health problem, and a security problem. More broadly, what's the biggest difference between 1962 and any time after 9-11? We are not just focusing on state actors. I just gave you a very happy picture of how social actors and government actors can come together. But most immediately, I think, if you think about uh, non-state actors, many people are going to say uh, they're going to be thinking about al-Qaeda, uh, and they're going to be thinking about uh, global criminal networks. Let me give you a broader perspective uh, on how we think about social actors. So the first two points here are the Landmines Treaty and the International Criminal Court, that's back in the 1990s. Those two entities, an international treaty and an international organization, which once would have been created entirely by states, came into being largely because of the nonstop lobbying efforts and activism of a whole coalition of non-governmental actors. Now, states were still critical. States had to negotiate the treaties, and in both cases, the United States is not a party. However, there is a landmines treaty, and they spent a good bit of time uh, in the White House and in the State Department looking at how the United States is going to ultimately be able to sign the landmines treaty. And the International Criminal Court is doing things like indicting Muammar Gaddafi. In some cases, we oppose that, but in many cases, we increasingly support it. You can then, as I said, think of the criminal networks, not just terrorism, uh, but global uh, narcotics and arms trafficking, trafficking in people and money laundering. In many ways, that is the dark side of globalization. All the things we do on the positive side, we finance uh, financial networks, trade networks. Well, they, they, the same networks trade in illicit goods. Then something like the One Campaign. Right? Celebrities bringing together lots and lots of different actors. This one is Bono, uh, and he not only brought together lots of, of different actors uh, for development purposes, but he created an organization that now partners with things like the Gates Foundation uh, and the State Department. And finally, political social actors, political networks. Now, I start with my Barack Obama. Uh, in many ways, the forerunner of what we're seeing in the Middle East happened uh, in the election of Barack Obama. He was the one who realized you could use social media, you could allow people to, to reach out to their networks, construct their networks, and he didn't try to control it. The result was a tremendous amount of self-organization. My boss, Secretary Clinton, uh, is uh, one of her greatest 
qualities, in my view, is she learns from her mistakes. Uh, she recognized that this was one reason she did not win the presidency, and one of the first things she did in the State Department was to hire uh, one of the people who had been in charge of this part of uh, Barack Obama's campaign. He's been developing digital diplomacy for the State Department, and I'll talk about a, a little about that. So then, of course, the Arab revolutions uh, that we are now seeing across the Middle East, we're, see we're seeing on a regular basis the uh, power of social media. We can talk in the question period about the exact role, but the Arab bloggers themselves will say uh, they couldn't have done what they did without social media. On the other hand, the, the cause and the motor of those revolutions is, of course, their own determination for change and their bravery. The Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street, again, neither one uh, could have emerged as fast as it's emerged uh, without social media, without the ability to network very, very quickly. And in Occupy Wall Street, which I, we've been watching much more recently, uh, people are using a technology called Meetup uh, that allows you, you can meet up about absolutely anything, but in all over the country, in big cities and small, uh, you can suddenly find everybody else in that community who's interested in joining you uh, for a protest. So social actors of all kinds, political, criminal, economic, uh, activists in lots of different ways are a big part of foreign policy now with states. So I said, Lego states, social actors. Then I said in the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was about diplomacy and defense. Now we added the third D. And indeed, uh, Ken mentioned that in introducing me, uh, when Secretary Clinton uh, testified before Congress, she talked about smart power, the three Ds of defense, diplomacy, and development. Uh, and part of her mission as Secretary of State has been to elevate development as an equal, uh, an equal pillar of what we do as foreign policymakers and practitioners. Development was all, traditionally its own world, its own discipline. It is still its own discipline. There's an expertise there, but it is part of our broader foreign policy. Why is not hard to see. These are just some of the issues, again, that we think about as our most pressing foreign policy challenges. Desertification, certainly uh, speeded by climate change. Food security, we spend an enormous amount of time thinking about how to develop a food security uh, program. It was President Obama's first announced foreign policy initiative. This is development, this is, you need this for basic prosperity, but it also has huge political implications. The price of bread and the likelihood of revolution are highly correlated. Uh, so in terms of political instability, food security plays a very important role. Global pandemics, this one of course AIDS, uh, but uh, in the, the first week in, in May 2009, the first day of the week we found out that the Taliban were within 100 miles of Islamabad. The second, two days later, the H1N1 virus broke out. And when every time that happens and it turns out to be another variety of the flu, we breathe a sigh of relief. For those of you who've seen contagion, we have to prepare against the day that that's not gonna be true. So adding a third uh, D, the three Ds of diplomacy, development, uh, diplomacy, defense, and development. The third dimension is tremendous interconnection. So we go from billiard balls to network nodes. We think about those states, and that, of course the state is still important, and I said you can take apart the government and mix it up, but the states themselves are the centers of global networks, political networks, economic networks, and social networks. Okay, I've summarized the state of the world, the first 50 years, what I think is mostly going to uh, structure the next 50 years uh, in terms of living in a world of both governments and social actors, uh, a world of a much broader range of foreign policy problems that include development, diplomacy, and defense, and a world of deep, deep interconnection. What's this mean for you? What does this mean for you personally? Well, you knew I was gonna put this up there. <laughs> it's just a question of when, right? 
so in Don, John Dickey's words, they're worth repeating again. They're really quite wonderful. The world's troubles are your troubles. And there's nothing wrong with the world that better human beings can't fix. It's a marvelous way of thinking about both world events uh, and, and, frankly, your place uh, in, in helping to fix them. I want to talk about the implications of the world that I just described for your professions, for your power, and for your leadership. Right? Your, the students, anyway, are probably going to lean forward most on professions. Uh, so I'm now going to give you the, the secret to your future career. Uh, so first of all, this world of interconnected foreign policy problems, you should be thinking about your careers in terms of uh, problems, clusters of problems, rather than disciplines. So if traditionally we thought about how we divide the world in terms of the study of the past, the study of politics, the study of society, the study of, e of monetary or economic relations, uh, human psychology, philosophy, all the different disciplines, they're still very important. I still think you need a firm grounding in one. But if you're thinking about your career, you should be thinking about what is the set of problems that most interests you and what from lots of different disciplines are you going to be able to need to pursue those problems. So here, if you're thinking about uh, how you can both get knowledge and experience, you should be thinking of clusters of issues, human rights, human welfare, the environment, uh, food, broadly understood includes nutrition, agriculture, and delivery systems. It's a, it's a very uh, complex uh, set of issues. Urbanization, migration. I could give you, you know, 20 more, but you should be thinking about sets of problems. Each of those sets of problems will require you to know something about the, the history of wherever you're studying the problem. More generally, the politics, the economics, you certainly need to know psychology, but you should be thinking about the cluster of issues first and the discipline second. I'm also going to suggest that you can invent your own profession. I did. I introduced you introduce myself as a foreign policy curator on Twitter. Nobody appointed me foreign policy curator, but that's what I do. I review probably, I don't know, 150, 200 tweets a day, and I send out the ones that I think are important about foreign policy. And people all over the world follow and send me things back. Many people are starting to call themselves curators. And I want to give you an idea of how traditional professions are actually fragmenting into new functions that you are probably aware you actually perform, but there's no job title out there that says that. So create one and bill yourself that way. From reporters are finders, mappers, and I would say crowdsourcers. They are people who find facts. There are many tools to do this at this point, from social mapping to crowdsourcing uh, to creating your own information network. Editors are verifiers. It's very important to know uh, the, the, what sources of information uh, are reliable. Uh, but they're also curators. They're deciding what streams of information coming in ought to make it into a story. Reporters do some of that as well, uh, but definitely the, the editor plays that role. A publisher is aggregating multiple streams of information. And increasingly, you see this already. Before you get the paper, you get the website. And the website has the raw stories coming in. And you can think increasingly of a publisher as putting together multiple streams of information from, in multiple products. Public relations, it doesn't, in a, in a world this interconnected, uh, it, it, it doesn't even make sense. Uh, to think about it. What you're really doing often is convening lots and lots of different actors who you want to connect to whatever it is you are promoting. Diplomats are connectors. Diplomats have always been connectors. Diplomats build relationships with other countries. Increasingly now, they build relationships with society. Secretary Clinton talks about 21st century uh, diplomacy being government to government, government to society, and society uh, to society. And finally, and I'm going to come back to leadership in a few minutes, 
But leaders are much more likely to be catalysts. They are bringing people together, convening, connecting, and mobilizing other people's uh, energies rather than the sort of traditional notion of a leader either commanding or way out in front and expecting everybody else to follow. There, I, th I would suggest that you think about what it is you do and what word uh, would, in fact, uh, describe that. I was talking about this concept uh, with a columnist for the New York Times, and he immediately looked up and said, well, I'm a witness. That's what I'm doing. I'm a witness. I'm not going to get involved. I can't. It will destroy what I do, but I am bearing witness uh, to what other people experience. Okay. There's your professions. Let's talk about power uh, and the nature of power. I recently gave uh, the uh, Joseph Nye lecture at Princeton. Uh, Joseph Nye, who was the a very distinguished public servant uh, and professor, and I'm sure you've read some of his work. Uh, he, the last five books have power in the title, so it was easy for me to figure out uh, what to focus on. And his new book is called The Future of Power, and he has something that he calls the three faces of power. He's describing power over, and I'm going to go through his concept and then talk about how I think that's changing. So power over is top-down power, not surprisingly. It has three faces in his view. The first is I can exercise power over you by commanding change. I can order you to do something I want you to do, and I can coerce you in some way. I can also provide incentives, but I can command change. I have to tell you, as the parent of teenagers, I could say it. it, it's not working. Uh, so, but it is, of course, the classic way we think about power, coercive power. Second way that you can get people to do what they don't want to do is you can constrain their options. And here, this is the first lesson of bureaucracy. You go to your boss and you say, well, let's see. Uh, you, know, you can go to war, you can do nothing, or you can negotiate. You structure the choices in such a way that people are going to have to choose at least in the broad direction of what you want them to do. And finally, uh, and most deeply, uh, you get people to do what you want them to do by convincing them that's what they wanted to do all along. You structure their preferences. I'm, I'm working on this one with my teenagers too. Uh, you, so this is in, uh, one way of talking about soft power. Uh, the, the world wants, in, in many uh, instances, culturally, the world wanted to be like the United States. So Hollywood and Coca-Cola, they were ways of actually convincing uh, people that they wanted to be like us uh, in various ways. Now that's true primarily through technology. But in all sorts of ways, norms, culture, we shape people's preferences. That's power over. Let's talk about power with. So the first thing in power with is that it's bottom up. Uh, it's bringing people together and using their energies to accomplish something. It's not getting them to do something they don't want to do. It's getting them to do something that you want them to do in the sense it will solve a problem. Instead of commanding change, power with begins with convening and con uh, connecting. It begins with bringing everyone together or everyone that you need uh, to work on on a specific problem. Uh, and if you just think again about how the mod uh, technology like Meetup or Facebook or any social media is used, that's the first thing it does. It finds the relevant people and it connects them. Second, it's, you don't constrain anything. You invite participation. So think about the open source movement. And think about the open source movement in terms of software, but also in terms of politics. It's all about opening up and making transparent the software, the code uh, that people are working on, and then inviting everyone to participate and creating ways for them to participate. So whatever they develop, they can plug in. Similarly, open source politics, as I said with my Barack Obama. Uh, it was about opening up the Obama campaign, letting people organize themselves, letting them connect to their friends, letting them think of slogans, uh, opening things up, making them non-exclusive, uh, and then creating ways that people can actually participate. And finally, instead of shaping preferences, you actually have to loosen your own. 
if you're really going to exercise power with, the power of mobilizing people to solve a problem, you bring them together, you invite them to participate, they'll very quickly figure out if all you're really doing is asking them uh, to talk and then imposing your will. If you, just think about it, situations you've been there, been there where you realize the person leading has an idea of what they're going to do, and they're going to do it more or less regardless of what you say. Maybe they'll, t they'll tinker a little around the edges, but often you know, meetings are convened to bless what the chair has already decided to do. That will not work if you're actually talking about mobilizing people, getting their energy, getting their participation, uh, really uh, using their power collectively. You have to open it up so that they can decide to do things, even if what they decide to do is not what you originally thought was best. Now, if they're going in completely the other direction, you might figure this isn't working and walk away. But broadly, you have to let people actually decide, and you have to be part of that. And if people don't sense that you're willing to do that, they will not follow you. Now, let me just say before I leave power, this is still power. It's still getting people to do something. It's not like the coercive power is power and this is some kind of touchy-feely mobilization. It's still about power. It's still about leadership. One way to think of this is to think of coercive power in terms of a ladder, where people want to be at the top of the ladder and then they want to be able to tell everybody below them what to do. Power with, think of a web. The person who's at the center of that web has the most power. They know the most people. They can bring them together. They're in a position to actually mobilize uh, people to do things. People on the edge of the web are, are like people at the bottom of the ladder. So it's still power, but it's power with others uh, to get things to happen. And you have to, as I said, uh, loosen your own preferences to make that happen. So that's professions and power. Let's talk about leadership. There's a wonderful book uh, by Nan, Nanurl Cohan, who was the president of Duke and was a political uh, theorist and teaches a wonderful course on leadership at Princeton. Her book is called Thinking About Leadership, and this is her definition. Setting or clarifying goals for a group and mobilizing the energies of members of that group to achieve those goals. So, she uses that definition for a homeless man who is the leader of the people in a broader camp of homeless people. And she uses it for herself as the president of a university. Uh, and she applies it to more traditional political leaders. Think about it. Setting or clarifying goals for a group. Now, some, if you're setting the goals, then you are obviously starting with something. Uh, and But then, in many cases, you're getting them, the group, to clarify what they want. But then what you're doing is mobilizing their energies to actually achieve it. This is a view of power that can apply equally to coercive power, power over, or power with, but I think it's particularly well suited for thinking about a much more horizontal, interconnected, networked world. All right. If that's the definition of leadership, all of you can be leaders. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how traditional things that governments do are now increasingly in the hands of people like you. So this one is USAID, obviously our development agency, to Kiva. How many of you know Kiva? Well, not every, a lot of people. So Kiva uh, is an online lending uh, platform that was founded by a couple uh, young people who uh, had worked in development, but it's, you can go online, identify a project in any area you want, uh, in any region of the world, in any particular area you're interested in supporting, uh, and you can lend money that will then be used in microfinance uh, programs. Hundreds of millions of dollars are already actually being spent. Uh, and hundreds of thousands of people are participating. And Kiva is very new. Kiva is uh, no more than uh, three or four years old. Now, that's not going to replace USAID, but it, it is, that model is growing in lots of different ways. And it shows that anybody can actually set up a platform that will actually, uh, in this case, mobilize funds, but other, 
alternatively, energies around a particular problem. From National Democratic Institute election monitoring to Ushahidi. How many of you know what Ushahidi is? Well, many fewer, okay. So we, National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute both monitor elections. Congress gave them money uh, to sort of hold them a little bit at a distance from the U.S. government itself. They're very good at it. Places like the Carter Center do election monitoring. Ushahidi is a crisis mapping platform. When the Kenyan elections, the most recent Kenyan elections were held, there was a lot of violence. This was three or four years ago now. Four regular computer programmers got together and created a software that would allow anybody anywhere in the country to text what they were seeing to a common platform and then to map that instantly so that you could look and see voter fraud happening here, violence happening here, somebody needs help there. All you needed was a cell phone and a number. That is a crisis mapping platform that when the earthquake struck in Haiti, the same person I mentioned before, Alec Ross, who's the Secretary's uh, Special uh, Advisor for Innovation and somebody who worked on the policy planning staff, who's now head of Google Ideas, immediately went to the people who developed Ushahidi and said, how do, we, how do we adapt this so it will work in Haiti? We need a way to text who's under rubble, who needs help, what is happening all over the country. There are now thousands of uses of this platform. It was developed by four people who were responding to an immediate problem. You can go on the website, you can see how to use it, you can contribute. It's now a nonprofit organization that is expanding the uses of this technology. And finally, from the Special Envoy for Gaza Reconstruction, or Disengagement and Reconstruction, to Palestinian Political Risk Insurance. Uh, one in, after the Israelis pulled out of Gaza, uh, Jim Wolfenson, who had been president of the World Bank, was appointed the special envoy uh, for Gaza disengagement. He was a former investment banker. Uh, he had lots of financial connections, lots of political connections, and his job was going to be to help reconstruct G Gaza. It didn't work. There's a long way to go uh, in terms of the humanitarian conditions in Gaza, but recently the CAP, the Center for American Progress, got together with the National Mideast Alliance, which is a, an NGO, uh, with AIG, the American insurance company, with a Palestinian insurance company, and created a political risk fund for Palestinian business people. One of the problems of trying to make or sell anything in Gaza is obviously the political instability. So normally when that happens, large corporations get political risk insurance. This was a plan developed from the bottom up in terms of what people on the ground needed that took a think tank, a corporation, an NGO, uh, and ultimately the State Department, the USAID put in some funding, but it was a, a ground up initiative. We've just been talking about how Dartmouth students uh, are traveling more and more. We, the Dickey quote, the world's troubles are your troubles. You increasingly have the tools to be able to do something about it. Uh, and all you need is the, desire, is the awareness that you can lead. So lastly, in the 1970s, there was think globally, act locally. This is sort of the mantra uh, for environmentalism uh, and various other movements. I put to you that for your generation, it's the reverse. You build local. You start with a local problem. You then connect to others who are doing the same thing in other counties or cities, uh, in your region, then nationally, then globally. You build local, you go global through hard, the networks and new technology uh, and the world, the it, deeply interconnected world we're in, and you change the world. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take questions now. Uh, we have two individuals with microphones at either side of the room. Uh, and be, you'll raise your hands, we'll recognize you, uh, but be sure to speak into the microphone because we're recording this. 
And secondly, uh, as is our tradition at all Dickey Center events, students get first priority with questions. So please raise your hands. It's plenty of plenty to question, plenty to ask about. That was you can ask me about it in the Middle good. East. Uh, we don't have to talk about the broader conceptual things. We can talk about any foreign policy issues you like. Please raise your hands. Who's going to go first? Great. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Slaughter. You, you spoke about this idea of the Lego world, of an interconnected world, and how that's being driven by the net. I remember over the summer, essentially within a, about a month of each other, seeing two separate stories in the New York Times. The first being about this uh, so-called internet in a box technology that the State Department was developing to essentially um, kind of put in, in place when governments are trying to shut down the internet in countries all around the world. Uh, about a month later, you had riots in England in which the British government essentially used uh, monitored Facebook and Twitter to uh, basically crack down on, on the protesters. How, kind of in your mind, do Western democratic states balance the positive and negative aspects of net openness and net diplomacy uh, without seeming, uh, I guess, hypocritical in situations where that openness is, is potentially used against them? It's a great question. Uh, and I'm afraid a certain amount of hypocrisy comes with the territory. Uh, we, we, I was very much a part of Secretary Clinton's internet freedom speech when WikiLeaks broke, we weren't thrilled about it. There were many people who saw that as a contradiction. It wasn't, of course, and I can explain to you why. <laughs> but it, 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 that, so to some extent, uh, the technology is not inherently good or bad, right? The technology itself is neutral. It can be used for many good purposes. It can absolutely be used for many bad purposes. And you use the example uh, of, of the London riots. But just last week, we're looking at many American corporations that are selling surveillance systems to the very governments like in Syria uh, and elsewhere who are using it to track down and arrest or kill people, the very people we're supporting diplomatically. So this, the, uh, the, the technology can be used either for oppression or liberation. I, I happen to think that the, the, given that there are many, many, many more people than governments, social media, media allow, gives people a better chance of staying one step ahead of governments, and that's why I think it's, it's been very important. But uh, effectively, the answer to your question is we are going to have to develop rules about the internet that are an amalgam of our rules of freedom of speech, of privacy, and of security. We've, this is, the internet is where we live increasingly, it's where we shop, it's where we connect politically, it's where we commit crimes, uh, and unlike traditional freedom of speech, it is controlled as much by private actors as public actors. So you can't, you know, it's, the First Amendment isn't going to do it, because the First Amendment does not apply to Google or Facebook or Amazon uh, or Apple. So. I would, the first thing I'd do is recommend you The Consent of the Networked. It's a new book that's coming out by Rebecca McKinnon that lays all of this out. But that is going to be an enormous task for all of us who basically care about our own rights, but who also care that the, if I can put it the same way, that the technology of liberation stays one step ahead of the technology of oppression. Yeah, given the importance that you think social tech, social media will play in, you know, um, liberation, do you, do you imagine? Can you see a future in where the where the United States starts to put increased diplomatic pressure on, say, China to take down the firewall? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the Secretary Clinton declared that the freedom to connect was a fundamental human right. What she was doing there was to say. You know, we, the United States, stand for basic human rights. In the 21st century, that has to include the right to connect to the internet and then the right to act freely on it. And it, she gave that speech the very same week that Google left China for Hong Kong. And of course, you can imagine the, the headlines. It was, it, we'd, we'd been working on that speech for six months. But it was precisely to legitimate, as part of our diplomacy, our, say, our pushing other governments to provide, to be more open, uh, not to censor, not to have the, have the firewall, but equally, I gave you the example of Beijing, to say we can send out electronic messages over social media or anywhere else commenting on what we see, and that's our right uh, as diplomats. 
uh, in, in, hosted in a country. You know, I'm not certain we're going to, uh, the diplomacy is going to make the difference, but I think highlighting a government's information policies is very important. And fundamentally, there are plenty of governments who are looking to China uh, to find out how they're doing it. There are plenty of governments out in the world that would like to be able to control uh, social media and to censor much more efficiently. We need equally governments that are showing people uh, how to get around uh, some of those blocks. But then, as I said, there are also ways in which private actors are constraining us and we don't even know it. Professor Slaughter, you had briefly mentioned uh, how economic deprivation can cause other problems. You used the example of food riots. Um, I spent the better part of this summer working for an NGO in India. We were working on a food security project. Um, and obviously, the economic hardship is heartbreaking in a sense. But as an econ major, I've read a lot of papers that essentially come down to saying that economic institutions and a government's economic policies have a huge effect upon the economic outcomes. So in India, for instance, the small-scale reservation laws, restrictions on foreign investment and the like are causing tremendous hardship for many Indians. So like, I realize the, I'm a Canadian, the Canadian government was helping support what this food security project, and I assume the American government does much the same. I realize these programs can try and make the lives better for the poorest Indians, but in a way, as long as the Indian government has some bad economic policies, it's going to continue to harm these very unfortunate citizens. So is there anything that the international community can do to try and help encourage better economic policies among these less developed countries? It's also a very good question. And actually, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, it's Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate economist who, wrote, who originally pointed out that there's never been a famine in a democratic country. I mean, India has food security issues for sure, but it's never had a famine. And his point was, look, it's not about small programs or even larger economic issues. It's about the ability of citizens to signal what's happening and, and have a government that has to respond. But beyond the, the sort of the, at the broadest level, first place, you're, you're very right that it's a lot of domestic policies. It's also our own, right? If we would lift you know, our sugar subsidies, if we would lift a lot of our agricultural subsidies, we would do more for farmers being able to sell their goods in Africa and India and other places than anything we're going to do on the development side. So I think your, your, your question points out that we're operating within a fairly constrained box. We can push on governments to loosen up some of these policies to the extent it's related to food security problems, right? We can do it as a development issue. A lot of the times, though, they're, you know, why do we have subsidies to our farmers, right? We have lots of inefficient policies that protect different interest groups, and so too do the India, does, does the Indian government. So we're not necessarily uh, going to make headway, but we can definitely use it. The final thing, though, is, again, to, to link the production of food to a larger economic system. That's what I said in, in thinking about food security. You know, yes, it's what's grown, and it's what kind of seeds you have, and it's what kind of irrigation you have, and making that more efficient. But then it's actually getting those goods to market, and that means roads, and that means uh, refrigerated uh, vehicles of some kind. And then once you're at the market, it has to be an efficiently, a relatively efficient market. Uh, so it's part of a whole distribution system that is ultimately part of a larger economic system, rather than just thinking about it as food. Yep, right here. Great. Um, thank you. Um, you spoke a lot about power and how we are switching from a top-down power to a bottom-up power. And I'm wondering, what does that mean for United States unipolarity in the international system, um, switching to a bottom-up power? I guess, in terms of China, should the U.S. be okay with China as a regional hegemon? if we're inviting participation? I'm glad you asked that question. It gives me a chance to uh, uh, affirm uh, some of Professor Mastin or Dean Mastinduno's writings uh, in the sense that, for one thing, I, I want to be very clear that everything I said today is additive, not instead of. In other words, the traditional world of power over and the traditional world of states clashing with each other, as we just saw this week with Iran, it's still there. That's what makes this so horrifically complicated. You have all the issues we've always worried about. They're still hugely important. We spent 
a lot of time talking about North Korea, talking about Iran, talking about China, and I am going to come to the point of your question. Uh, but we also spent a lot of time talking about the environment, talking about development, talking about uh, pandemics, et cetera. So it's both. Uh, and it's power over and it's power with. I don't think you can run the world all on power with any more than you can run it or things can happen uh, with just power over. But you, that, so let's go back to the traditional world. I don't think we're in a unipolar world, but I don't think we're really in a multipolar world either. Uh, we are in a multipolar world economically. Socially, I just don't even know what you call it. I mean, I put up that network map. I mean, that's, that's not polar. That's something else entirely. Militarily, it's still unipolar. I mean, we are still preeminent. Uh, there's nobody that can challenge us. Our ability to project power is far, far greater than anybody else's. Uh, but then you, so you then ask, well, but China's building up its military, and it's not prepared to challenge us globally. It may, I'm not sure it wants to challenge us globally, but it certainly wants to have more regional clout. And above all, it would like to set its own rules in the East China and South China Sea. We should be fine with China playing a very big role in its region. I mean, you can't imagine it not. Uh, but of course, Japan and Korea are, Japan's still uh, the third largest economy in the world, and Korea, South Korea is a, a very important country. Our view has been, not that it's a regional hegemon, but it can certainly be the biggest regional player, but it has to play regionally. Partly we've got allies there, partly for the stability of the region. So our response has been to say, of course, you, China, have very important maritime interests here. We understand that. We have maritime interests too. But you have to resolve the conflicts according to agreed rules. You can't make your own rules. This has the unusual effect of, for the first time in my life, the people in the Pentagon are supporting a rule-based international order every bit as much as the people in the International Legal Advisor's Office. Uh, it's rare that those come together, but for right now, our response is yes, we want China to grow, we want China to prosper, China is entitled to its own interests, but it has to play within the rules that everybody agrees. That also means we do too. First took office, uh, Secretary Clinton spoke about resetting the re relationship with Russia, and she had her little prop. Um, and it seems like remember we, that prop. <laughs> like nothing has happened. Where do you see we might be able to um, have power with or work with Russia in terms of some common interest in solving some, you know, world problems? Well, I don't think it's fair to say nothing's happened. We concluded the New START Treaty, which was enormous. I mean, we, we, we immediately, we did that reset precisely because when we came into office, we were barely speaking to the Russians at all. I mean, it was a very, very frosty environment. And we only had a year to conclude the New START Treaty before the Old START Treaty was going to expire. And we did get that done, and we got it through Congress. So, you know, a, a major arms control treaty uh, with, with Russia was a real accomplishment. I do also think we've worked pretty well with Russia on a number of issues uh, in the UN, uh, but also Secretary Clinton working with Foreign Minister Lavrov. They, you know, they have a, a good working relationship. We survived the missile defense uh, issues in Eastern Europe. We sort of did less than we were otherwise going to do, which made the Russians relatively happier. But at the same time, we're still sticking to the principle that we can put missile defense uh, in Eastern European countries. I think the, the, the real question is, can we get to a point with Russia where they don't see NATO as the traditional NATO, that where that NATO's line means, you know, where we're we're basically uh, we either that's where we're going to attack them from, or it's going to keep expanding. And they they keep making proposals for a new European space, and we keep saying, well, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe can basically accommodate that. We're talking, and I do think the relationship is better in the sense that we're talking. But there are still some pretty irreconcilable interests in terms of the way they see it and the way we see it. And then there's also what we now realize is 
Putin's return, and I think he is less congenial for us than the Medvedev seemed to be. So I, I do think we've done some things. There was a reset. I don't think we've, we've certainly not accomplished everything we wanted to. Uh, but I also think we're, we, we've been working with them pretty well uh, in, on North Korea and also now in the Middle East, less so on Iran. Right here. Hi, so this is sort of off topic a little bit, but since it's so rare to get someone from state, I thought I'd ask it. Um, so in the last couple of years, America's NATO allies have been paring down its defense spending. And I guess what's your personal opinion on that? And do you think that's good that say England and France are spending less on defense and so are the rest of so is the rest of NATO? And what is what does DOS think about, you know, critical allies cutting more of their defense expenditures and maybe a passing the buck more to the US? Well, the first thing the State Department would do is to remind this audience or any audience that the Europeans have roughly in the neighborhood of 50, 50 to 60,000 troops around the world. Some of that's in Afghanistan and Iraq, a lot of that's in uh, the Balkans, and a lot of that's in Africa. So that's 50 to 60,000 troops is a lot of troops. If they didn't have those troops there, we'd have to have those troops there because they're basically doing things uh, that we want. So first point is it's certainly true, and we saw it in Libya, that they are not spending enough. I was less worried about, you know, the, the, they weren't spending enough on ammunition, right? That's, that's definitely a problem, right? They're not, they're not spending enough on, on actually being able to fight with the weapons uh, they have. I, what I predict is going to happen is, A, the European Union very much wants to have a rapid response capability. That's an essential part of their view of their role in the world. That could be something like what, uh, England did in Sierra Leone, where it you know, had its ships offshore, sent in 200 Marines, so s relatively small actions, but actions that can make a big difference. That, I think, though, it, particularly in the current crisis, and this is assuming the Euro holds in some way, is going to have to lead to common procurement. So they can actually get quite a lot more than they're getting out of what they're currently spending, but they can't give it, get it if every country has their own defense industry. Now, I was just hearing today that you know, the, B, the uh, B-52 bomber, there was a part made in every single congressional district in the country. Right? <laughs> that is not an accident. And indeed, state is constantly lamenting, how come we can't have something in every congressional district so that we could get budget support? Uh, I say that because obviously it's not easy to just say, oh great, go to Europe-wide procurement. But my prediction is the desire to be a player plus the fiscal realities are going to mean they're not going to be able to raise defense spending in their current budget so much as they're going to be able to consolidate and get more out of it. And if Dean Mastenduno's nodding, I'm in good shape. <laughs> yeah. um, so you mentioned that um, the social media played a huge role in um, what happened in the Arab Springs. However, talking to relatives back in the Middle East and also reading a couple of the headlines from um, journals from the Middle East, uh, many proponents seem to think that it didn't play as large a role as the Western uh, media had said it did. And so what does this great divide in point of view and in opinion mean for this Lego world that we have when we seem to have a, this great divide into two um, distinct ideas and then, again, what does it mean for this idea of revolution? Great question. So, first thing I'd say is I, I'm certain you're right that those of us who are living on social media uh, are going to see things playing out on social media and assume uh, that they have a bigger role than, than many people who are not even on those media in, in various countries are going to have. So it's like the person looking for their keys under the lamppost because that's where the light is. You know, we're, we're looking at the messages coming across and I really, you know, you, you felt like you were getting a constant stream of information from Tahrir Square from people who were there while it was happening. So obviously you have this sense that it, it's happening. It, I think, it's true that for many people in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Syria, they're not necessarily being mobilized by social media. In other words, that's not what they're using. They, and there have obviously been revolutions before 
uh, social media. Here's what an Egyptian blogger explained about why it made such a difference. And then I would give you a reason why I think it made a difference outside. His point was that prior to social media, you had to organize physically, which meant you had to go to a factory, you had to go to a university, you had to get a group of people together, you had to have a meeting, you had to have a protest. And by the time you'd done that, the state could shut you down because it took so long that the state was right on top of you. That goes back to sort of the, t the competing technology that you couldn't, it would get shut down before you could actually build a node in a network. And that what they were able to do, and this is a pretty small group of uh, organizers who were very tech savvy, was to use the, the network in the media to basically get to send out messages in terms of where they were going to organize and what they were going to organize about uh, to all these different places at once and focus them on a common goal. So he used the examples of a factory, a university, a soccer club. You know, the soccer clubs were quite important, actually. They, they were the people in Tahrir Square who had the most experience dealing with the police because <laughs> they, they'd had a lot. Um, and so his view was that it was, it was essential for that part, but it wasn't essential for getting all those people actually out in the streets once people started coming out in the streets. The second thing I would say is I really do think it's been essential for Western support. If you didn't have the images coming out of Egypt and coming out of Libya and now coming out of Syria that you have, you would have far less diplomatic activity. I, I, my second tweet was sent after looking at pictures of what was happening in Tripoli. Uh, this was the end of February and it was just gruesome and that kind of image supported the idea that what was going to happen in Benghazi was going to be truly awful. And if you hadn't had that, I think from the Western point of view, it would have been much harder and you wouldn't have had, I mean, yes, you can smuggle out tapes and things, but you're getting it instantly from people on, 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 uh, on site. So I think you're right, but I'm right too. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Hello. Uh, I remember back in May watching uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu talk to Congress, and I remember the uh, the reaction that Congress gave was a lot more positive to what he had to say about the conflict in the Middle East and the Gaza Strip than what President Obama and President Clinton had to say. Uh, so uh, there's obviously some sort of disconnect going on, at least in, in what's the most polarizing uh, foreign policy issue today. Uh, but how do you propose fixing that? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just going to answer your question just until you got to that last little bit. Because what I was sitting there thinking as you were talking is this is a perfect example of Lego states. This is the Israeli parties engaging directly with our Congress. Right? I mean, it's, it's intermixed domestic politics. So uh, it, absolutely, there, there are many members of our Congress who are closer to many members of the Knesset and many Israeli officials than they are to anybody in the White House. And that's exactly this kind of taking states apart into their component parts. It gets much more complicated. I mean, we are hamstrung because there is no wind set right now between Israeli politics and ours uh, in terms of, of what we can do. What do I propose to do about that? I think in some ways my analysis tells you what I think is the answer. I don't think there any kind of progress on negotiations is possible with this Israeli government. And then the question is, as I see it, whether or not within Israel you're going to get people who are realizing the kind of isolation that Israel is bringing on itself at this point. For, and ultimately, you know, that, that can create a brain drain. The, the, it, it really has a cost for particularly the very hip, very technologically advanced uh, Israelis around Tel Aviv. On the other hand, Israel itself is undergoing profound demographic shifts. Uh, and the median age uh, is, uh, if you look at the, the younger uh, Israelis, they're overwhelmingly Russian immigrants, much more orthodox, uh, very, very different people. If that's where Israel is going, then I'm just, you know, I'm not sure there, there can be a two-state solution, and then we're in the world of a one-state solution, and we will have, mi we will have missed uh, a, a historic opportunity, and it looks very bleak. I'm hoping that's not true, but th that is possible. 
get I guess you get another question. <laughs> topic of Israel. Um, in the recent G20 summit, the president of France, President Sarkozy, was heard saying that he's fed up with the prime minister of Israel. So the joys and, of media. You'd uh, think um, these guys would have learned about open <laughs> microphones. <laughs> and I know that Sarkozy isn't really held in high esteem in the international world, but apparently quite a few people seem to be um, in conjunction with his opinion. So what does that exactly mean for the U.S. position on this Israeli-Palestinian issue? I'm not sure it's going to, uh, to matter. I think, I think you were hearing a very frank exchange. But again, this is an election year, or we're heading into an election year. Uh, I do not think President Obama is going to try to take on Congress or indeed many people in his own party who don't who don't want him to, to pressure Israel any more than he has or to make any, or to support Palestinian statehood or to do any of the other things you might do. Uh, he's not going to move. That's why I said it's a question of whether Israeli politics are going to move. Dennis Ross announced his resignation today. That's a pretty big signal. If your chief negotiator is not even going to be in the White House, you, we're not going to see very much. Uh, so I think it's probably, that may well be a true statement about personal relations, but it, it's not going to change the larger configuration of politics. I'm going to use the prerogative to ask the last question, because le this last question prompted me to ask this. Uh, WikiLeaks, you know, revealed a lot of things like this. Um, I have my own views on the positives and negatives of, of that, that whole episode. But I'd be curious, based on your experience, you know, in the State Department and then now back in the academic world, um, you know, just sort of what you think the lasting impact of WikiLeaks is going to be on the conduct of U.S. diplomacy. Multifaceted, but... You know. Great question. First thing is WikiLeaks showed that our career foreign service are highly <laughs> professional, very talented, and doing their jobs. Uh, and many people who actually waded through a lot of the cables came away really very impressed. Second thing, of course, is I actually think, for, for people like me who think we should, in fact, be more open about what we think about human rights uh, in various countries, it was uh, warmly received in Tunisia to find out that we had the, more or less the same view of the government that many people in the country did. Now, diplomacy has to happen. We have to take governments as they are. Uh, but it was striking to me that the role of the United States as a disseminator of truthful information, even if unwittingly in that case, uh, actually benefited us. And the, po the positive way of doing that is the embassy in Pretoria is becoming a platform for interesting and often critical articles about African leaders throughout Africa. So it comes through the, the embassy deliberately, not through WikiLeaks. The long-term effects, I don't think they're going to be that great. I mean, because it's going to happen over and over and over again. And it's going to happen to many, many governments. There is no way when you can put 250,000 cables on a thumb drive that you can keep this kind of information secret. I also think, you know, it's like listening to somebody on a cell phone and on an Italian train. Like they're going on about, you know, an affair or what their daughter did. I mean, the most intimate things with this somehow this belief that they're on a cell phone, they, they somehow are private. Increasingly, you have to do diplomacy, right? You have to actually engage. You have to sort of assume that it's going to be kept secret, even though actually, if you think about it, the, the probability that it will is, is getting smaller and smaller. So I think you know, it, it's, it clearly damaged some of our relationships. We, we recalled some of our ambassadors. It was horrific at the time. Secretary Clinton had to go around the world essentially apologizing to other governments for things our diplomats had said, knowing full well their diplomats had said probably worse things about us, but they hadn't been leaked. It was terrible, but I don't actually think it's going to have that much long-term impact, other than that everybody's going to be much more aware that everything they say uh, is likely to be public. But they're, what are they supposed to do? Stop talking? Well, With that, I'm going to stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I just want to close by thanking you very, very much and to say John Sloan Dickey would have been delighted to be here tonight. Thank you again.